Hi, um, I'm David Cho, and I'm a junior in college. I'm an anthropology major in Cold Falls Minor. And for my plant monograph, I chose to do humus with Liz, more commonly known as hops. And it's pretty fitting because I turned 21 this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> right, so, basic overview um, hops is most commonly known as the primary ingredient for, for beer making, but um, it also has a, has a history of use in Europe and Asia as a medicinal plant. Um, a lot of the characteristics that make it such a good ingredient for beer are also the ingredient, also the reasons why it's such a um, uh, good medicinal plant, such as its bitterness and a lot of the biological effects. Um, so, in terms of botanical description, it's a member of the Cannabaceae family, which is also uh, which the cannabis sativa or marijuana also belongs to. Um, there's not that many species within the Humulus family. Um, but the ones that do exist are based on different ge geographical locales and morphological differences. Um, they are dioecious, which means that they have distinct male and female reproductive systems. That's very interesting to see. I don't have the picture here for some reason. But um, they have, uh, the female and male plants are, male systems are very important, not just for reproduction, but also for the cultivation and, and the useful parts of the plant. Both the female and, male, uh, female, female and male plants have um, distinct um, panicles or clusters of flowers, and within these flowers are the the, um, the anthers, which house the resins. And it is within the female plants that the resins are more concentrated, and therefore female plant female structures are more commonly cultivated from um, traditional uses. Um, they've been used for cent or humus lupulus has been used for centuries all over the world, and for the most part, it's in Europe. It was used since the mid 9th century. It was actually a substitute for Mirka Gale, which was a primary means of beer um, production. It was only um, substituted like completely because it because of its preservative properties, which come into play later in terms of its anti antibacterial and antimicrobial properties as well. Um, Pliny the Elder, who was a you know, renowned ancient healer, he described Roman use of human syphilis in terms of its shoots being edible vegetables, the heads being used as dye, and also the, um, the flowers themselves used as flavorings for food. Um, for its medicinal uses, it's, it has such a wide array of uses. Mostly, um, it has been used to treat things like anxiety or insomnia. It's been used to treat tension headaches, which result in excitability or restlessness. Um, but it also has very um, interesting cultural and geographic uses. In North America, Native Americans have used it for um, a, a huge array of maladies, again, ranging from restlessness and insomnia, which are more common. But they've, they've also used it for things like um, rheumatoid arthritis, They've also used it to treat, treat pneumonia, which is very interesting. Um, they've also used it as a poultice. A poultice is like uh, some kind of heated matter that you place, um, I guess, while you sleep or rest on sore areas of your body, um, which is another interesting way that Native Americans have used it. In Ayurvedic medicine, um, it's been used similarly to treat um, restlessness and anxiety, insomnia, indigestion, and also in traditional Chinese medicine. But in traditional Chinese medicine, there's, there have also been uses to treat leprosy, um, dysentery, even um, tuberculosis, which has, which is interesting because current studies that I'll talk about later also um, go into that. They've, it's also been used topically for skin disorders and, and nerve um, pain. <clears throat> for chemistry and pharmacology, Oncology. There are so many different chemical constituents within the volatile oils and essential oils, but uh, what comes to mind are the three main ones, which are the terpenes, bitter acids, and calcones. There's also a range of flavonoglycosides, and um, but I think the most important ones are the bitter acids. They make up anywhere from five to twenty percent of the chemical composition, and um, they are also the most studied. Um, the alpha and beta acids, particularly are not only responsible for it, it being you know, very useful as a brewing agent, but also for, its an, for the antimicrobial and antibacterial properties. Um, so, oh, and also another one is a, a flavonoid glycoside, um, xanthahumol, which is very like, uh, 
prominent right now in research against um, a lot of different diseases, which I'll talk about later. Um, in terms of biological activity, I think that there are three main ones, a sedative activity, um, antimicrobial, antibacterial, and also estrogenic. The, in terms of sedative activity, it's, you know, it was first studied because hops pickers were seen to be more fatigued and tired than um, when they would pick these plants. And, um, you know, studies show a lot of um, contradictory, maybe inconclusive data about that. But there have been conclusive studies in terms of its hypothermic effects and um, anticonvulsant effects and things like that. In terms of its antimicrobial, antibacterial properties, um, I think that the most significant study that I read about was against mycobacterium tuberculosis, which affects a third of the population right now. So if this plant could be used to create some kind of drug or vaccine, um, I think it would be a very potentially powerful drug. Um, in terms of estrogenic properties, um, it was first studied again with hops pickers, um, where the women, the female hops pickers, would experience um, menstrual abnormalities, and so it ended up um, leading to a lot of different studies, which I'll talk about later. Also, in Germany, where like beer is huge, they they use hops baths to treat gynecological disorders and also to treat menstrual discomfort, which is really interesting. Um, the clinical studies. Uh, the main ones that I talk that I'm going to talk about are the are epilepsy, leukemia, um, menopausal discomfort, and sleeping aid. I think that the most significant study was by Herrick, and um, this study was the first double-blind, placebo-based, randomized control study where um, they found that giving tablets of the pseudomonas and um, plant allow after six weeks of use a significant decrease in menstrual discomfort, which is pretty significant. Um, another study, a Chinese study, showed um, that there were strong inhibitory effects on certain leukemia cells, which also shows this cancer, anti-cancer properties of, of this plant. Um, the sedative properties, which I talked about before, they've been widely studied, but it has led to um, research indicating that it could also be used as an antidepressant which is, I guess, kind of paradoxical because it is a sedative, but um, that's also been really interest interesting to see. In terms of contra contraindications, um, there's a lot of issues surrounding the efficacy of the chemical constituents because they have to, a lot of the studies are based on the solvents that they use, but depending on what kind of solvent they've used, it's, it's affected the efficacy of the plant. And so um, that could be said of like whether or not it's, it's actually the plant that's um, you know really doing some kind of significant work or not. Um, another one is issues with treating depression or uh, patients with like sleeping disorders or neurological disorders. There have a lot of there have been issues between that. Um, I think for current uses it's being marketed in terms of estrogenic properties for like breast enlargement, which isn't necessarily like connected. But they have that. There's also different creams that are being um, produced right now, um, which contain the xanthohumol, which I talked about before. The xanthohumol, or XN, as it's more commonly known, is really studied right now because of its antibacterial properties. Um, it's even been studied against current mouthwashes, just to see its effects and um, comparing them to what people use currently. Um, it's also very seen to have potency against HIV. And perhaps more, most significantly to me, against malaria, there's never been like a malaria vaccine, or even there, even though there was a failed eradication campaign, the fact that there has been, um, you know, strong inhib inhibitory effects shows that this drug could be very potentially um, powerful in that in that way. And in conclusion, I think that this plan is sig more significant than just making beer. I think it's had. A, a huge array of traditional uses, and it's, I think it has so much potential um, in its different chemical compounds, but also because of its abundance around the world, it's easily cultivated, easily grown, and easily picked, um, and so I think it's an awesome plant. <laughs> Thanks.